I'm here with physiotherapist and ADCC competitor Livia Giles and SNC coach Ben King discussing strength and conditioning for Jiu Jitsu. In the last video we began to look in depth at the SNC program Liv used to prepare for the 2019 ADCC European Trials with a particular focus on the warm up. Now we can jump right back into the discussion and focus on the main SNC sessions from January to April. And then having done the warm up, so that warm up was the same for each of the sessions during the week and Looking at this program, you had three training sessions each week, one on a Monday, one on a Wednesday, and one on a Friday. Could you just tell me about the general goals for each of those uh, different workouts? Were they all the same or were there different uh, reasons for doing each one? Sure. So in this phase, uh, it was exploring her strength capabilities. So, you know, we were still pretty close to injury itself and we we're trying to figure out exactly what she wish, what Liv could do with her knee and her body. So, uh, yeah, I guess that the, the major focus of this was basic strength and I use that in parentheses because uh, it, it's difficult to say exactly where this fits on the false velocity continuum but I guess the the idea of the training program was to expose it to some general strength and what was always in mind is this, this was January and we were competing in April so I had to be uh, from a competition point of view you know there's periodization models out there that say you've got 8 to 12 to 15 to 18 months to prepare but I had four so I had to be pretty aggressive and, you know, live as well. I had to be pretty aggressive in terms of what we could do right now and what we could do on the mat. So I guess from a, a weekly point of view, we had two main strength days and then the Wednesday was a little bit higher load and a little bit more of a hypertrophy day. Uh, and that fit, that fit within uh, her general training program in terms of on mat um, and work and, and, you know, other commitments that she had uh, around her training program. So if I look at the strength days, which were Monday and Friday, they share a similar um, like pattern in terms of how you design them for the main program. Could you just talk through a little bit about um, each of the lifts? Because you have one, two, three, four, five, essentially five lifts there. What was the role of each mm. of them and, what was the, and how did the session flow? Sure. So we chose deadlift as, as a primary exercise because of two reasons, really. One being that it, it presented less knee flexion, uh, and particularly under load, is that the, the deadlift starts from the ground up um, and going through a squatting exercise can uh, obviously has the eccentric propulsion down uh, and that puts more load on the knee. So from a deadlifting point of view, it had less stress on the knee and also worked the muscles surrounding the knee. So it was, it was a good place to start. Um, and it was, you know, and it was enough of a justification to do it twice a week because we could get a really high stimulus. And uh, if I think back to doing the program itself, we could go pretty heavy uh, without really aggravating the knee. And from a general strength point of view, both within the muscle itself, but in the you know central nervous system, is we could get a really high stimulus with a low cost to the joint itself. Immediately following that, as I wanted to then attack what we had just essentially avoided is a single leg uh, position. So both a split squat and a Bulgarian are both putting the knee in a fairly high uh, range position as we're putting it in deep flexion. We're putting it in positions where it necessarily doesn't want to be in um, as much as we had just avoided it with a really high heavy stimulus as I still wanted to address that position and single leg stability and strength is really important in any, uh, you know, ACL rehabilitation. So, I wanted to attack that pretty quickly off the bat after we had done our main primary lift. On the Wednesday, I did have box squats. And the reason I had box squats is, again, it's, it's limited knee flexion. And we're not going to a lot of depth to get the knee into that point where the meniscus can kind of grab. So from that point of view, on the Wednesday, is I wanted to still have some sort of knee flexion under load because I knew she was going to experience that on the, on the mat, give it it being in, in, front, uh, in passing guard, in standing positions, in, you know, there, there's going to be an element of knee flexion. So if I can expose that to her in the gym before she feels it on the mat, that's going to be beneficial. So with the box squats, I had it quite high initially, and that's a progression. We really didn't progress the weight that much. It was we progressed the height of the box lower and lower. Towards the back end of the program, you can see it's mainly upper body, and that was more congruent with the goal that we had of, of general mass building and getting heavier and stronger relative to that 60 kilo goal. So you can see I've got, uh, you know, upper body pulls, upper body push, seated rows, lap pull downs, horizontal rows, etc. just to build general strength and general mass across the upper body. Um, and one of the things I wanted to address across both of the programs, or, or sorry, all three of the programs is a hamstring strength is given that we always think about the, as I said before, the vastus medialis and the, anterior muscles surrounding the knee, but also the, the posterior muscles do 
just as much work in terms of stabilizing the knee, but also in a jiu-jitsu context is uh, shrimping and holding positions in, in a knee flex point of view is also going to be important. And again, to reiterate the point that I want to expose the knee to a knee flexion point of view before I went into a, a dynamic sports specific uh, knee flexion uh, feeling. So yeah, I was always trying to precede what was feeling on the mat with my program. Uh, sometimes that worked really well. Uh, sometimes that we had to adjust just to fit in with what was happening on the mat. Great. So if I look at the uh, the structure of the different programs, so on Monday and Friday, you had like a primary loading lift, which happened to be your deadlift. You did that for a number of sets. Um, I think it's four sets there. Was it five, three, one? What does that mean? So five, three, one for us was a warm up. Uh, five, three, one was just a especially in the early part of the program as we were very conservative and I certainly was uh, just trying to feel out where Liv was from a, a knee perspective. So 531 gave us three different levels of loading to work into before our main working sets. So a set of five at the, at the easiest way possible. And I'm pretty sure the first session we did was just the bar. Um, then it gave us, it, it gave us a little chance to take a risk each session before she did uh, three sets of five. So her main loading was three sets of five. Every session as we had five, three, one, just to maybe take a little risk to see where she was at in terms of lifting. So we may go five, you know, a set of five at, at 60, a set of three at 70, a set of one at 80, and then three sets of five at maybe back down to 70. Cause we were pretty comfortable. She was there already and we can work back down at that. So when I say five, three, one, I always want to, I was very conscious of her warm ups. And as I said before, I like to take calculated risks within the warm up itself and expose her to what is coming within the working set themselves. And I can work within, uh, you know, I can practice heavy singles. I can practice heavy threes, uh, in a calculated way, but certainly when we first started the program, it was, just a, it was just an attempt to kind of see where she was at. And I certainly think, you know, that's a relevant concept for me as a progression and strength conditioning coach, but for any strength conditioning coach out there is that, your program should have an element of calculated risk in them. And I'm not saying that you should progress them linearly every week or you should progress them exponentially every week, but have little elements there where you're just testing the boundary and see where it's at. Is that, you know, you shouldn't be maxing out every week, but just see where you are. And if that one feels great at 80 kilos, maybe your three sets of five are at 75. Or if that one feels terrible at 80, maybe your three sets of five are at 70. It just gives you that little indicator of where you're at for that day. And you can make specific adjustments for where you are on, you know, your working set. So I really like the five, three, one up, And I think it both prepares you well for the specific stimulus you're feeling in that set, but also gives you a little bit of feedback in terms of how you're going to progress that weight for that day. And it's almost auto regulation for how you're going to uh, progress that athlete for that day. Great. Liv, what are your thoughts on that? Do you like that 531? And, uh, and what do you think the benefits are of doing that little bit heavier weight before you drop down and then come back for your working, your three working sets of five reps? I used to hate it because it was like just more reps. <laughs> um, so like when I first started doing it, and it was a little bit different in, um, in January just because we were testing at my knee, but now I use it more as a, you know, my, my one might be like, 80 or 90 kilos and then my working reps will be like 20 kilos more than that but um i used to sort of just when i was lifting by myself do like a warm-up with i don't know a bar or something and then go straight heavy um and this made my warm-up really hard so i just thought I, I was doing more work but what i found is that um my sets were way better after that and it was that like you know now if i don't do a good warm-up my like my 80 kilo deadlifts will feel terrible, but then my 100 will actually feel better than the 80 because I'm actually still kind of warming up. So um, I do actually do that quite often still. Um, I just obviously now my sets are heavier than the warm up. From a, a scientific perspective, this uh, 531 is is the potentiation that we were talking about earlier before you do your your actual like competition, or which in, in this case is your 555, five, mm -hmm. five, your three sets of five, right? So that's the, the role of that. Um, that warm up and how it is beneficial for the for the working sets. So essentially, you start off with a primary lift, which was deadlift, and then you went on to two other lifts, and you've got two A and two B. And I guess that what this means is these are supersetted. So you're going to do a split squat, then you're going to go and do the ancillary, which would be a, a RDL, and then you're going to go back and do the split squat, and then do the RDL, and then back and, and forth. Right? That's how it works. Is, is it Ben? 
Yeah, and the main, I guess the main consideration for this is uh, mainly time, is that you want to be timely in the gym. You don't want to spend hours and hours sitting around the gym. But I guess from a, a, a scientific point of view, is there's some evidence to suggest that there's a greater amount of hypertrophy uh, if you're giving the, re- the muscle itself less rest. Um, is it you stressing it back and forth, back and forth without spending long time as in between uh, giving it you know, too much rest necessarily? And then, and then you move from that into the upper body. So you had upper body pull and then upper body push. And again, these were done in a superset manner. So you did your ring chin-ups, then you went to your floor press, then back to your ring chin-ups, then back to your floor press again. And could you just talk a little bit about why you chose floor press there for Liv? Um, because that's a pretty unusual exercise that uh, I guess most people might not be familiar with. Sure. So coming back from uh, you know a, a long layoff of exercise and and some of the little niggles that we had with Liv in terms of her shoulders and some of her elbows, which you know most people experience in terms of their you know jujitsu career, uh, we wanted to limit the range that her elbows were going through. So if you're lying on the floor when you lie down, your elbows are going to hit the floor before you can actually get the bar to your chest. So that can be a nice way of limiting the range that your actual your elbow and your shoulders are going to go through. And it allows you to expose to a little bit higher load. So theoretically, you should be able to lift heavier on a, a floor press, particularly for a jiu-jitsu athlete. If you're a power lifter or you know, a weight lifter listening to this, maybe that's a little bit different because of the skill of the this, uh, the element itself. But particularly for a jiu-jitsu athlete or for someone that's just kind of using a strength conditioning to supplement their sport, the floor press should be able to lift heavier, especially because the limited range will be able to expose you to a certain weight, which eventually you can then translate to a full lift itself. So that was part of the justification for this exercise. We're coming back into a program. Okay, I don't want to go straight to a full bench press, particularly given I know lives, shoulders and elbows don't necessarily tend to like going through that full range. Um, the second reason is why I had upper body second in the program or, or uh, ancillary is that I wanted to prioritize the things that were most important for her first and have you know lower body exercises, proprioceptive exercises, uh, things that were going to really affect and impact the knee going forward uh, at the very start when she was fresh, when she was ready to train, when you know her central nervous system was at its most receptive to stress and put the upper body stuff at the bottom of the program because we can just squeeze that stuff in there at the end uh, as it's not so much a priority where the lower body stuff is certainly A1 in terms of getting back from this kind of injury. Great. So Monday and Friday share the same uh, structure in terms of the primary lift, then two supersets of the lower body, then two supersets of the upper body. Uh, and then on Wednesday, you had a, like a different structure here. You had uh, a primary loading with your box, uh, your box uh, squats, but then you went through your single leg squats, then your, then your bicep curls. Um, and then you went again and you did another three set of supersets where you did upper body pull, upper body pull again, and, and then a, a third upper body pull superset one after the other is that is that correct so the, the wednesday itself was a little bit of an unloading day uh because i just was cognizant of the fact that we were you know doing heavy yeah you know, deadlift itself was a lot of stress on you, you can consider it almost a full body exercise given that it stresses the thoracic lumbar hips uh knees and ankles so it's a, it's a fairly all-encompassing exercise itself so the wednesday was a little bit of uh an unloading exercise um so we wanted to attack some of the some of the not weaker exercises itself, but some of the, the things that we could squeeze in the program where they couldn't fit elsewhere. Um, and we, we had the supersets in a way that was facilitating again, that hypertrophic environment in the muscles that we wanted to grow. Um, the reason that we had bicep curls in there is that Liv had a number of joints that we wanted to work, but not all of them worked that well. And the, the joints themselves weren't happy going through a lot of range or a lot of load. So, Bicep curls presented us, one, a really good way of uh, working the elbow joint, which tends to be pretty stressed in jiu-jitsu specifically, but probably more the primary goal was to build mass and to get towards 60 kilos as we had to build mass wherever possible that we could. And the biceps themselves tend to be a pretty easy joint to train at a low cost to the rest of the program. Uh, so we started in that point of view. So the reason I use so many supersets in here is Wednesday was a bit of a lighter day. It wasn't so much of a, a heavy day as Monday and Friday were really heavy and hard days. Uh, and Wednesday was a little bit more of a an easier day because, again, we we're cognizant of the fact that Liv was getting back to more rolling, uh, getting back to normal training. And this was just a, 
a day we could train, uh, but not necessarily overload her with S and C. Sure. And that's like the, the structure of the training program and how the lifts were done in each day. But then this is the first week of this program and each program was four weeks long, right? So January was four weeks long. And mm. as you went from the first week, to the second week, to the third week, to the fourth week, you changed the number of uh, working uh, sets you did and the number of reps you did in each set. So as just an example of the deadlift, um, every week you always did that five three one as a warm up. But the first week you did three sets of five. The second week you did five three three three. So then you went to, from three working sets to four working sets. The third week you did essentially four sets of three. And then the final week you did three, three, and then one, one. Could you just talk a little bit about why you changed the, the rep ranges and the number of working sets as you move through from week one to week four? Sure. So from a principal point of view, this is progressive overload in a nutshell, right? Like it's the, you start from somewhere and for this exercise to work, you need to raise in some sort of capacity to raise the body's capacity. So choice that I made in this program specifically was to raise intensity. And in any program you can raise, you know, volume, you can raise frequency, you can raise density, but given the time that we had and raising to the competition that we had is that I chose intensity as my main variable to raise. Uh, because I, again, to go back to what our principles were at the start of this, uh, start of this talk is that we needed to raise RFD, we need to raise general strength and we need to raise mobility and strength of the joint itself. So I chose intensity as my main variable. Um, and, you know, you could argue that I wasn't really given a choice in that sense is that I had to get the joint and the intensity back up to a level as soon as I possibly could. So this program was a little bit of touch and feel. And I, I will admit when I was writing, I was being fairly aggressive in that I wanted to get from, you know, say three sets of five doing heavy singles as quick as possible. But, uh, you know, it, this was the unique environment that I had with Liv that she could give me really good and specific feedback on how her knee was feeling and how, you know, and it could inform me on the program itself and how I could be aggressive and take risks at certain stages. So certainly I think the reason why I progressed in that way is, is to facilitate progressive overload and to make sure that the program was progressing at least in some way and it wasn't, you know, staying the same all the time. So then as a basic concept, if, if you, don't change the program, you adapt to what it is and you say the same. One of the good anecdotes that I like to tell, you know, quite often is Milos of Croton is that as a young boy, you know, in ancient Greece, he picked up the bull on his shoulders as a baby and carried up the hill to drink water. And he kept doing that every day. And all of a sudden he was a grown man and it was a grown bull and he was carrying, a, you know, a very heavy bull. But if he was a young, young boy and tried to carry the bull on the first day, it wouldn't have worked. So the same thing with Liv is that I tried to, to start off with something relatively easy, a set of five, figure out what weight would work, but very quickly is move into a more intense range to proceed the force, uh, the amplitude of and the magnitude of force felt on the knee before she felt that on the mat. So that's the reason why we progressed it over week by week like that. So in week three, you had uh, basically four sets of three. In the final week, you went three, three, one, one. Um, so then the amount of reps that you actually did there kind of decreased quite a lot, but then maybe the intensity went up a little bit. Um, what was the role of uh, that week four? Yeah, I mean, the way that I saw it working is that if I exposed her to a higher amount of intensity, so I really take her towards a max, and it gives me that informant of where I'm going in the next program. The way that my programs tend to work, and this is not you know a blanket rule, but I like to have the introduction week as a bit of a deload because I'm giving you new exercises, I'm giving you new skills, I'm giving you new things that you may not have felt before. So I want to give you programs and movements and things at a lower degree of volume because they're, they're new, they're, you know, they're stressful, they're things you may not have felt before. So my fourth week in the program, I hope is the most intense. And then the fifth week as in new program time, especially in Liv's case is, you know, back down a level. So this week I hope was the most intense. And because it was the most intense, I was happy to draw back on some of the volume. So, you know, dropping say reps of three down to one and really, again in this specific context is i really needed to know where we were at in terms of strength perspective if if liv wasn't pulling say you know i give her 60 kilos and she couldn't put 60 kilos on the bar for one rep i would really it would really dictate where i was going ahead as i need to spend more time developing a base and going ahead but if i could give her a one back to where we were before this injury 
Um, and, and again, this is always in consultation to where she was at. Then it would really inform the next program I would write. Um, I don't want to be too stuck in my ways of where the program's heading. Uh, I want to be reactive. I want to be agile. I want to be making sure that the program I'm writing is specific to where the athlete is at right now and not to what my preconceived notion is going forward. So I wanted to make sure that the the program that I was writing was specific to that fourth week. And then week five is when I started to progress things is that they were relative to where Liv was at in week four. So I wanted to, it's, it's almost uh, testing in a, in a controlled environment and seeing where we were at just about a given three months out of competition. Liv, um, at this time in January, how much training were you doing away from the gym? Like how much jiu-jitsu training were you doing and how hard did you find this, uh, this gym training for you? Hmm, good question. It's all, it's all, to be honest, it's all blending in a little bit and I tend to forget the, the quite traumatic things. Uh, but by the end of January, I was rolling, um, I was pretty much rolling, but with a lot of limitations uh, that my partners could do to me. So I would be very, very specific with who my training partners were and I was very specific with what they could and couldn't do or, you know, how quickly I would tap from certain positions. I certainly wasn't doing any wrestling. I certainly wasn't changing directions with my Toriando passes, uh, but I was doing a lot of like uh, leg entanglements and 50-50 where it was a little bit slower pace. Um, the volume was pretty high at that stage with jiu-jitsu training um, and that's because I couldn't do like full scaled rolls. So I could actually uh, like, you know, starting on the back or, or in 50-50 is not very energy consuming. So I did spend quite a bit of time on the mat, especially by the end of January, I was doing most things and I was getting like every day I was getting in a new position. Um, and then in terms of the gym, it's hard to tell because the, the actual weights probably went that hard at that stage because I literally, I didn't have the permission to go full board everything just yet because the knee was healing but it actually takes quite a bit mentally to to do the whole program and and every day you're kind of really pushing your boundaries in terms of what your body and your mind can take and that alone is actually quite energy consuming so i was pretty exhausting uh, exhausted just from like doing training on the mat and and training at the gym and and obviously working and coaching but a lot of it was uh, uh, that mental exhaustion as well um just trying to figure out where what i can do and and where i can go next with my training sure and i mean i brought that up because if you look at that training program and you were like a, a fitness athlete you might say that's quite quite easy, but when you add all the other stuff in it, you know, the psychological stress of coming mm -hmm. back from the ACL injury, the fact that you're rolling on the mat, et cetera, that's why the, the level of difficulty, or, you know, you possibly could have done more mm -hmm. if you were not doing other stuff, but I want to point that out because I think that's something that gets lost. People, especially if someone's not an SNC coach, they're more like a personal trainer and they pres prescribe something for an athlete, they might not take into consideration what the athlete's doing in the rest of the training and therefore give them a, a lot more load or a lot more reps or a lot more sets or whatever it would be. Um, so that's, that's the reason that I brought that up. I, I even like laugh looking at my Instagram stories. Um, you know, it's a year ago, it was about a month out of ADCC. So looking at my Instagram stories where like we had what I thought were like insanely hard programs and the volume was harder and uh, the weights were a lot harder at this time last year, but now in isolation. So if I go and lift and I might like, you know, oh, I'll see if I can do this program. It's actually not that hard, but that's because I'm, you know, not like I'm rolling with Lockie and then I'm sitting on my butt for the rest of the day uh, working in bed. So uh, yeah, exactly what you said. They're, they're not that hard in isolation, but it's a whole new thing when you've got a, you know, another four hours of training every day. So that was the introductory program in January. We just come back. Let's now switch and, and look at February. And we see that there's some changes that have occurred in February, Ben. So the first change is the, uh, is the warm up, right? You, you know, you changed a few things in the warm up, and specifically now we start to see some, uh, some jumps and stuff being introduced into the warm up. Could you just talk through quickly uh, a little bit about the warm up and, and why you changed these things? Sure. So as the program progresses and the athletes become as uh, the athlete, as in live, becomes more adept to the program, is some of the things that were then program exercises that were actually causing a stimulus and a change will start to become, you know, easy and become part of the warm up. So I certainly started to move 
uh, things that were in the program to a warm stage is if, if I didn't see them serving a long-term process is I move them up the program and become part of really what was an easy exercises or something that I wanted to keep in a program, but wasn't going to give us a, a, a huge stimulus going forward, uh, given the position. So say something like a split squat, um, I moved into the warm up would become an easier exercise. It wasn't something that we were going to be able to load up long term. And it was something that we could have as part of a proprioceptive. And I still think it was beneficial in terms of warming up the knee and, and the muscles that are around uh, the, the ACL and, and, and just the positions that we get her in. Um, to the second point that you raised is the jumps and plyos. So certainly, uh, you know, and again, you, it's not specific to Jiu-Jitsu itself and it's not going to provide you a specific movement or a specific stimulus that you feel in Jiu-Jitsu. But what it was specific towards was the forces, the actions and the dynamic positions that knee needs to feel and the muscles themselves need to feel in dynamic movements on the mat. So double leg jumps, as you can see, feature heavily and they're pretty dynamic. So, you know, jump and, and jump and land, broad jumps, double leg jumps is uh, across the week they progress. So from Monday to Friday, they progress from, you know, vert and land to stick to then on a Friday, we were doing uh, vertical jumps in continuous moments in a barbell position. Again, I was being pretty progressive in this program in terms of where I wanted to take live from point A to point B is maybe if I had an athlete for six to eight months, I wouldn't go this aggressive, but you know, everything's contextual. So you need to realize in this program that I was going from, you know, February to April to competition. So I needed to be as progressive and aggressive as I could in terms of taking live from just getting back to feeling comfortable with the jump to getting a barbell on the back, which is a very, very different feeling that the, the, the knees feeling. So, um, you know, in terms of the double leg, double leg jumps, I want to, progress as quickly as I could on that regard. And then uh, on a single leg jumping point of view, you can see that I've got, you know, bound and stick with a bound is one leg to the other. So like left to right um, on a Wednesday, I would go hop. So like same leg to same leg. So left to left or right to right. And then on a Friday I would go lateral. So then a different point of view, which was something that we really struggled with is going laterally and particularly medially, medially. So going inside of your knee facing that way and jumping across is that with an ACL and MCL it tends to be quite stressful given the, the way that the body lands and the upper body position across the knee. So you can see I only had that on a Friday and it was something, again, I, I like to think of the programs themselves as in some things are going to be more safe, uh, RDLs, deadlifts, and we've done them in the, in the programs beforehand. They're going to be safer. They're going to be things that you can bank on and you know they're going to work where you want to take a little risks in your program to, to start to progress and you're going to have little calculated risk where you can. So that's where the jumping came in. And that's where I wanted to progress both the double leg jumping from a general strength point of view and getting used to landing and feeling, an, uh, you know, the joint stress itself, but also from a single leg point of view is that we can get some joint stability and joint uh, RFD and power around the, the joint in a single leg position. Yeah. So I see here, like essentially what you've done now is you've, You've switched your program, so the first two exercises of the of the program are all jumping based. One is double legged and one is single legged, and then you move on and you and like so for example on Monday you have uh, one A and one B, so you're going to superset going from double leg jumps to single leg jumps back to double leg jumps back to single leg jumps uh, over and over, and then you go to your main loading. And here you've got like a rack pull and hand intrinsics. Could you just talk about what a rack pull and what hand intrinsics are, and uh, why you decided to switch to this now? Sure. So uh, a rack pull is essentially just a deadlift, but off a, a, a rack. So you might set up, uh, you know, plates on the ground to raise the bar up or, you know, rack uh, pins themselves to raise the bar up. So is it, it's reducing the range of motion of the exercise itself. Uh, but what then can happen is then we can increase the load because you're not at such a low position to lift up the weight. So you're a little bit higher, a little bit more advantageous position to lift the load, um, which means the intensity can come up. And again, I was always cognizant of the fact that we're in February and we're competing in April. So I wanted to progress the intensity as quick as I could. And certainly given that I was introducing jumps into the program, which would mean more joint irritation, more uh, stress on the joint itself. So that I need to, not necessarily, I didn't need to give someone the program, but I, I was cognizant of the fact that given those two factors that I needed to increase intensity and that I was increasing uh, joint impact somewhere else in the program that something would have to come down. So from a rack pull 
perspective, that's where the, that's the justification for that. From a hand intrinsic point of view is, I guess it's twofold, is the main reason is that between rack pulls are very heavy and hard and you need to rest. And uh, hand intrinsic exercises or group exercises are fairly low level on the central nervous system and they're kind of fun and kind of hard. Uh, the third maybe somewhat reason is that they're specific to jiu-jitsu in that grip training is very important. So um, you will probably get grip training mainly from your jiu-jitsu training and holding onto gis and holding onto arms and legs in different position. You will probably get that already. Uh, but particularly given Liv's training, she may not have been getting the main amount of uh, programming that she wanted. Um, so we had a little bit of grip training in there. And then secondly was just to fill in the time between heavy rack pulls because rack, rack pulls are a very intense and difficult exercise. So we wanted to supplement that with some sort of exercise in between those sets. So Liv, can I just ask you, um, you're doing your deadlifts previously and then you're moving to these rack pulls. So essentially a rack pull is a deadlift, but from a, a higher position. What would be the change in load that you would do when you went to the rack pull? So let's say you were, let's just say you were pulling 100 kilograms from the floor in your in your deadlift, what would you go and do rack pulls on when you changed uh, exercises? Uh, probably about 130 to 140 I would do for the for the rack pulls. Yeah, so quite, yeah, 30, 40 kilo difference. That's a pretty high percentage. Yeah, and it's also compared to your body weight, which you're aiming for 60, but you're probably a little bit less. That's like basically pretty much twice your body weight for the rack pull, right? Yeah, 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 more than more than twice. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, hand intrinsics? What exactly are these exercises? Can you just explain them? For anyone who doesn't know, intrinsics are like the, the small muscles. So uh, interesting, intrinsic muscle of the hands would be like your all the little muscles inside your hand. Um, so I think for this one, we're literally grabbing like a five kilo uh, or two and a half kilo weight. And we were just going from like that sort of pincer grip um, and, and swapping that between every finger and then going back again so uh i mean relevance to jiu-jitsu it probably depends how small someone's joint is like that you know but it did work like so we're not working the big forearm flexors and or extensors to that that do this to your wrist we're working all the little hand and finger muscles to to get slightly better grip but um yeah i don't know if it improved my grip strength, it was like literally like a good distraction, um, not to think about, you know, like having to have to amp myself up for doing, maybe not when I was doing sets of six, but towards the end of the month, I was trying to do like my sort of one RM for the rack pull. And um, yeah, so in the end, it just provided a different stimulus to grip training and, and a slight distraction from um, doing heavy rack pulls. Sure. And Ben, going back to this thing again, I, I see again, you're using the same kind of, uh, structure in terms of how you're changing things from from week to week so you're increasing the intensity each uh, each week it seems like yeah so the first week like i said before it was a i guess a t a deload week and i was very cognizant of the fact that we were introducing jumps uh single leg positions and things that were going to be very stressful on the central nervous system itself but also the joint uh positions and the joint structures themselves on the injury itself so uh, i was very cognizant of that fact and i was very aware that the you know the, the program was changing a lot so in that fact the the rack pulls had to give and two sets of six to me represented a, a, enough to maintain the weight but not too much to affect uh the overall loading so i started there but i was also you know very aware that we need to progress quickly so we started from there and progressed all the way to some heavy doubles towards the end of the program because um, again, intensity was something in the program that we couldn't compromise and we need to main maintain and make sure she was getting enough intensity to, to, as we said before, to make sure that both the muscles themselves are feeling intensity, but also the central nervous system was activating to a, at least a, a relative level uh, to maintain or increase the overall level of strength and power. So that's the reason I, I progressed so quickly. Perhaps again, in a different program, I wouldn't progress so quickly, but certainly in this program, I was aggressive. I was really quick and we we're maintaining and increasing the load. Um, and as Liv just said before, we, we were pushing to, you know, levels of two to, you know, just over two times body weight uh, as quickly and as aggressively as we could. Great. And so we just talked about the February training program there. So if we think about the progression across the months in January, we started off with some basic strength and some, and some hypertrophy. Then when we got to February, we, the goals kind of changed a bit and we started to challenge the knee with uh, eccentric plyometric loads. 
uh, while continuing to build that muscle mass. And now if we look at the, the March program, um, what were the key goals here? You, it's changed slightly, didn't it? Yeah, so really this was like pre ADCC and we're really looking to ramp up the program. I was always very aware of the fact that this program was preceding uh, what was happening on the mat and there was more force, more uh, more range and more speed on the knee itself. So as a strength and conditioning coach, you've always got to be really aware of what's happening in the sports practice. And in this case that, uh, you know, programming was getting more and more specific and on the mat, uh, Liv was experiencing more and more stress, more and more uh, specific positions and more and more positions where, you know, she may feel uncomfortable, stressed, swollen, et cetera, et cetera. So my program had to reflect that, but also accentuate that. So, that you know, that's where you get in that real tight rope tightrope and uh, balance position where you need to make sure you're doing enough but not too much and particularly with a load compromised athlete um, and, and, a, and an athlete of lives caliber is you don't want to be doing too much to affect the training but you don't want to be doing too little to not actually doing anything so from a jumps and plier perspective we progressed the the jumps to be higher force higher speed uh, so you can see double leg jumps uh, and, and including banded and kettlebell jumps. So they're higher force and higher eccentric force of the banded jumps were pulling down into the ground. Um, and then on a Wednesday, we're doing banded kettlebell swings. So increasing the eccentric force of the uh, the kettlebell swing itself and and relative to the force that lift could produce. Um, so from that from that aspect, the the double leg jumps increased, you know, marketably, and then the single leg jumps themselves. You can see diagonal jumps, uh, single leg bounds, and skater jumps all progressed relative to the knee's position and the knee's progression and ability. Uh, but we're being very aggressive in terms of how quickly could we load this knee in positions that it doesn't necessarily want to be in, uh, but positions that it needs to be in. So inside uh, positions, pushing off the inside edge of the foot, uh, you know, relative levels of valgus. And I, and I know that valgus is a scary word and something that we're always trying to avoid, but a position that it, it can be in and push off in and create force in without putting into a catastrophic position. So, yeah, certainly in March, we, we ramped up the program quite a bit uh, from an intensity point of view, but volume-wise, we kept it quite low because the uh, training, specific drilling uh, on mat stuff was becoming quite intense. So I had to be uh, you know very aware of the amount of training she was doing from a holistic point of view. So you mentioned a couple of words that people might not be familiar with. Let's just talk about valgus first of all. What does that mean exactly? Sure. So the, the, the position of the knee becoming closer to the midline. So if you imagine the knee uh, exists like that, femur and tibia, and if the knee crosses in towards the midline, so, you know, the typical ACL you may see in basketball or football or, you know, soccer, depending on, you know, they're the most commonly ones you may see. Uh, but that position itself lends itself to, you know, medial stress uh, is in the medial ligament that lives here, ACL that lives down the middle. Um, and I know I'm using hand in positions. Hopefully you're listening to, if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, if you can't see this, but uh, it's it's positions of the knee, the ligaments themselves can get stressed in and a position the knee lends itself towards injury. And not to say, I, and I hate, uh, you know, one of the things that lives in strength and conditioning world and even physio world is that Valgus is the devil and it's the worst thing ever and never go to Valgus because if you do, your knee will blow up and everything's terrible and, and go home and never play sport again. Uh, the best athletes ride the line of Valgus and non-Valgus and th the most athletic positions present themselves with a little bit of Valgus, but there's, you know, as, as Dan Pfaff says, and, you know, Tom, you, you can speak more towards his philosophy than I can, but, you know, there's bandwidths of acceptable range and ex acceptable positions for every exercise in every position and, and valgus is an acceptable position given a certain amount of range and certainly on a on a um acl rehab i want to be able to expose that to a, a relative level but not too much that we're causing or exacerbating a previous injury so with live um providing you know skater jumps or diagonal bounds which you can google if you don't know what those exercises are but it provided at least a little bit of, of valgus and a little bit of inside stress to the knee Again, this side where some of the injuries had occurred before that uh, in, in jiu-jitsu positions when you're trying to pass or when you're trying to stand up in certain guards, those stresses happen in sport. And this is not just jiu-jitsu. This happens in every sport. So if I could expose her to a little bit of that before she felt it in the sport context, I was doing at least a little bit of my job to make sure that she was protected, protected, I say in parentheses, from what was happening in the sport itself. 
Yeah, so this uh, this valgus thing, very simply, is knocked needness. When you see people with knocked knees, yeah. this is basically valgus in, uh, in, uh, you know, for, for your layman. Um, I think that was well described. So let's uh, also, the other thing that I noticed that you talked about was banded jumps. What is a banded jump? What exactly does that mean? So in this context, uh, Liv was doing a broad jump, which is essentially jumping as far horizontally as you can. But we actually got a, a you know a power band or elastic band wrapped around her waist, connected to either a cage or a position who's stable behind her. So that was either me holding it or wrapped around a pole, uh, and she would try and jump as far as you could away from you know that position. So horizontally, you can also do this uh, wrapped around your shoulders, either you know cross across your body or straight down. Uh, to try and jump as vertically as far as you can. And, and what the band does is creates more tension against the body. So you actually have to produce more force against the band to create, uh, you know, displacement at, you know, either horizontally or vertically. So that it was a progression in terms of uh, load. Uh, and, and particularly what I think is really relevant in, in especially a vertical context is the band, the more you stretch it going up, the more it's going to pull back down. And to learn this lesson, all you need to do is hold a rubber band and pull it as far apart as you can and let it go and it'll hurt your fingers as much as you pull it. So if you pull a little bit, it won't hurt that much. If you pull it a lot, it'll hurt a lot. Uh, and the same is true is if you jump a little bit, it won't produce that much force. And if you jump a lot, it'll produce a lot of force. So in terms of that, the manipulatable variable in terms of her jumping progression is that if Liv jumped to a maximal capacity, which I trust that she could, uh, it, it would be able to produce a lot of downforce in, in then allowing her knee to produce eccentric force quickly and put it in good positions to accept uh, load going eccentrically. And what I notice here as well is when you look at the rep ranges that you're using now, you're basically using three reps, four reps, et cetera, pretty much, uh, and only in the first week, only two sets, but in later weeks, uh, three sets. But the, the rep range is now quite low. Can you explain a little bit about why you've uh, gone to lower reps, especially on the Monday and the, the Friday? Yeah, so super low volume. Uh, the, the purpose of this program, generally speaking, was to at least maintain, if we could, build strength qualities. But I was very aware of the fact that at this stage of the program, her technical and tactical load was very, very high. And that included a lot of specific drilling. It included a lot of uh, rolls, open mats, uh, things that were going to stress her from a very high uh, you know, central neuro perspective. So if I could maintain some strength qualities in the gym, I was happy. If I could build them, I was ecstatic. Uh, so, you know, we we're very cognizant of the fact that this is the hardest and most intense point of uh, her program from a specific point of view. So my gym program had to reflect that and I had to make sure that well, she wasn't necessarily feeling those feelings in a, a gym perspective when she was getting all that stimulus on the mat. Um, you know, I think that's where, you know, if you think only in a strength engineering perspective, you can sometimes get lost is that when the program is most intense, it's sometimes you need to counteract that with what you're doing in the gym. So you can even see on the Wednesday, one of my exercises was just a stretch is that I knew the program overall was very intense. So my program, even though we were so close to competition is I could go, you know what, I can take a back step here and just do a stretch just to counteract what she's feeling in the middle of her week. It's the, it's the most intense time. I can just back off a little bit and, and be a bit more conservative. So yeah, super low volume, looking to at least main, maintain intensity, uh, leading into what was the most intense part of her program. So Liv, during March, that was like basically between four to six weeks out from the actual trials. What kind of jujitsu are you doing at that point? I think probably like April was, I was feeling pretty good on all fronts and ready to go. I think mid-March, I was uh, just getting back into wrestling. And when I say I was getting back into wrestling, I was definitely drilling. I was coming to all the classes, doing the warm-up and drilling a lot. And I was choosing some of the lighter girls that um, I felt a little bit safer with to actually do a little bit of wrestling. Um, that was probably the hardest thing uh, to get back, uh, especially because ADCC is obviously very leg lock and wrestling heavy, uh, and you can't ignore that part of training. However, to get good at it, you have to obviously train it, and the training is a very big injury risk. So it was a really fine line between um, feeling confident and not having a panic attack if it went to overtime, which my semifi semi-final did and I had to wrestle, uh, but also not just wrestling the whole time, knowing that, uh, you know, injury, getting an injury like a month out again out of the trials would be um, game over for me. So 
training, uh, yeah, wrestling was still a little bit uh, lower intensity than usual and very, very careful. Uh, but jiu-jitsu training was starting to be, um, now I don't think I was doing all positions just yet. Like I was still, I think I still had that end range of knee flexion was a little bit limited because of my meniscus. So I still wasn't really comfortable with people um, putting a lot of weight on me when I was sitting in their closed guard. Uh, however, I could sit there. I just wasn't great at yet standing up and defending those things. So I knew that sometimes I would give up a sweep or an armbar because I couldn't fight out of those positions. Uh, but I was pretty much uh, close to full intensity. I could really get my heart rate up. I could do most things. And at that stage, I was telling people less and less what they could and couldn't do. And I trusted myself to tap uh, or, or say stop if I didn't like some of the positions. Um, and I think, I believe I was still wearing a brace, but maybe from, um, I wasn't wearing like a big chunky brace anymore. I was just wearing like a knee sleeve, more just for proprioception and to remind my partners which knee uh, was dodgy. But um, yeah, about a month and a half out, I was getting pretty close to rolling at uh, close to full intensity. Brilliant. And so here we've shown the, those three months, January, February, and March um, of the program. Can we just talk a little bit about how everything changed in, in April? Did you continue to do strength and conditioning all the way up to the trials? Did you stop it uh, slightly before then? Um, what things changed in that last uh, month uh, or the last kind of couple of weeks before the trials? For the first half of April, we did continue with uh, pretty heavy SNC as well as training. And I think I left uh, for Poland or Europe. I was teaching a couple of seminars, uh, probably the, the third week or maybe mid, mid April or third week of April. I probably had about five days before the actual trials. I caught up with my sister in London and I didn't do any strength and conditioning for that week just because, uh, I mean, we wanted to taper and also I didn't have really a chance while you're traveling. It's hard enough finding a gym to roll at with good training partners and then finding another weights gym and so on. So I do like to taper quite a bit before I compete and I really like feeling fresh. Uh, however, I did do like just before the trials, even though I wasn't doing weights for that week and a half, I did do proprioception uh, just because if I don't do it, so if I don't do the balance and the hamstring activation and so on, uh, my knee actually feels loose and floppy. So I kept that up until I competed pretty much. And I was uh, heavily taped up as well to, to provide my body with a bit more um, sensational of where that knee was. Yeah, that sounds uh, exactly right. I mean, it's interesting to see if people do continue strength and conditioning right up to the point of their competition. Um, in track and field these days, people do uh, continue it pretty close to the to the to the competition. Usually, they stop maybe like um, between two weeks and three or four days out. Um, but with the with the high intensity, low volume program, like similar to the one that you were doing in March, you can continue it. But I don't think there's any. I think one week off of strength conditioning is not going to uh, mean you're going to lose all of your strength before your 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 big day. Um, for sure. So I think that kind of makes makes sense. And it's, uh, you know, it's similar to what we talked about with uh, Lockie when we talk about his preparation, how the last two weeks, you know, you've really got to be careful and make sure that you've got all your energy and you're fully recovered and ready to, um, you know, to train, especially if you have to cut, which wasn't the case for you, but um, would definitely be an issue to make sure that you address if you're mm -hmm. an athlete cutting weight in that in that those final couple of weeks. Yeah, it's, it's a whole new territory to me. I've been cutting weight for the last, you know, eight years or so. So uh, it was quite nice to walk around and just eat whatever I wanted to. And interestingly enough, I think I was also taking creatine to help uh, with the bulk as well. And so my my gut just, I after about two months of taking creatine, I had to have a little bit of a rest from it as well because I was getting an upset stomach. Um, so I think I got to about 58 kilos, but by the time, so having that week off creatine and having um, a week off, actually lifting weights and training as much and just resting i actually weighed in at 55 kilos at the trials and i was like what all this work and i'm back to 55 just within a week so that was pretty pretty frustrating but then the build up to actual adcc from there i did actually um, get to nearly 60 kilos so we ramped it up even even more after the trials <laughs> 
Yeah, and I think that's worthwhile bringing up um, a thing, uh, thing which is that while you're developing muscle mass through this, this training program, it is actually quite difficult to develop muscle mass. And probably one of the most important but overlooked factors of this is the fact that um, if you want to have muscle hypertrophy, you need to, one, have an uh, increased calorie intake, but also you need to make sure you're fully recovered, which includes sleep, it includes having enough time between training sessions, etc. And one of the challenges with something like jiu-jitsu is that the fact that you're, in order to be good at jiu-jitsu, you need to train a lot, especially as a pro athlete. Probably most people train pretty much uh, every day. Um, sometimes multiple times a day. So to do all of that training and build muscle high, uh, muscle mass on top of that uh, is extremely challenging. Um, and so do, do you feel like uh, you were able to put on muscle mass doing this training program and, and coming back with the ACL thing? Or do you feel that there were some things that made it hard for you to do that? I, I definitely um, underestimated how hard it would be to put on muscle mass. And my body type, I, I do actually get muscular and bulky quite quickly. So I never thought it would be an issue for me, um, especially because I've always been cutting weight. And after you cut, uh, if I cut a lot of weight, I do bounce up a, a little bit higher because you go on this eating binge sprees and so on. So I thought, yeah, I won't have a problem. I'll, I'll be 60 kilos in three weeks. But uh, all the things you're talking about, I completely underestimated and especially my rest. I also found it really difficult. So uh, when I cut weight, I work with a sports dietitian called Reid Rial. He's a black belt. He did his PhD actually in weight cutting for combat, uh, combat athletes. So I've had a really good working relationship with him. And of course, I wrote him a message, can you, can you help me undo the cut and do the opposite so he gave me rough guidelines on you know how to get him enough calories in uh, but I actually found it really really tough like so when you're always training really hard um, you guys have probably experienced just feeling a little bit sick and not being able to eat as much for probably an hour or so after training you know and so I would ha like sip my protein shake or whatever I could to get my calories in or have a sandwich but I really needed to eat more than that and I would have to wait probably 30 minutes to, to an hour not to feel sick after after hard rounds. Uh, but then I would have to start work and it was really hard. You can't eat in front of a patient. So uh, I, I did actually find that really hard. I had to meal prep. I actually did get, you know, quite a bit of takeaway and, and try to get all the like sour cream on top of everything and eat dessert as well just to get the calories in because I was training uh, probably four hours of rolling plus SNC plus a very active job plus coaching. So probably the amount of calories I was burning was massive. Um, and I definitely wasn't resting enough, you know, go like work or active work where I'm actually demonstrating or teaching someone how to do, um, I don't know, plyometrics is not exactly rest either. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, now that I'm in quarantine and uh, I've definitely gained a bit of weight um, and I'm eating a lot less than I was when I'm training full time, but I'm, I'm resting a lot more and I'm obviously using less calories. So, uh, yeah, I think I think <laughs> definitely get your rest and eat enough. I think that is so, so, so important. Yeah, brilliant. So I think uh, today we've managed to hopefully give um, people an understanding of like what a strength and conditioning program probably looks like for a, com a competitive grappler. And of course, we talked about previously um, what, what a strength and conditioning program might look like for uh, a recreational grappler. Maybe we could just finish off um, by talking about the fact that, of course, we've shown this program, right? So probably people are going to go away and they're going to kind of start copying the, <laughs> the program to some extent. Ben, what kind of advice would you give to someone looking at this program and saying, okay, well, what elements would need to be adjusted for each individual? Um, based on their circumstances, what would be the main things that you would keep the same and what things would you probably change a lot depending on the athlete? So the main things I would keep the same is working firstly around the competition. So understanding where the competition is and how the rest of the training fits in that. Uh, being the strongest, fittest or fastest athlete on the mat won't uh, counteract or make up for the fact that you are the worst the jiu -jitsu athlete on the mat. So prioritizing your skill training, prioritizing your technical tactical training would be the first point of call and fitting in your strength and conditioning around that, relatively uh, speaking, compared to the training program. And as we've spoken about, your training program and, is, and with Liv is that early in the program and particularly through February uh, relative to the April training, uh, the April competition, sorry, is that February and uh, March is I could really push and then the closer and closer we got to competition is I had to pull back 
and had to prioritize what was happening on the mat relative to what I was doing in the gym. So that's probably my first uh, and most relevant point of call is understand your known constraints, understand your competition constraints and uh, factor in your training in and around that. Secondly is I would prioritize strength as a fundamental quality first and try and build your strength as best as you can. Uh, obviously, relatively speaking with your technical tactical training uh, as best as possible in that time and layer in power training on top of that as a relative factor. Uh, you know, you, you can't fire a cannon out of a canoe and you've got to make sure you're as strong as possible before you start layering uh, some of the, you know, the power stuff. And there's plenty of research to suggest that if you're stronger, you can express a higher relative amount of your power, uh, you know, power training and power performance. So I would certainly try and layer on a, a strength foundation first and then layer on power as, as part uh, after that. Thirdly, as I would certainly, and, you know, as a relative concept throughout the whole training program is work on everything as best you can as while the program itself will prioritize certain things in certain areas. So as we saw with Liv, is early in the program was more strength focused. In the middle, it was more a hypertrophy focus. And towards the end, it was lower volume and higher intensity. So you could say, you know, maximal strength and power focused. Is at every stage of the program, I had a little bit of everything in there. There was a little bit of proprioception. There's a little bit of eccentric stress. There's a little bit of uh, proprioception. So none of those qualities ever went away. They were always in the program. Uh, so make sure you're always at least touching on each element, but you'll just turn some things up and some things down at every stage of the program. And that's where you can really layer on, as you see in later parts of the program, is you can really layer on some of the more dynamic and power stuff relative to the strength foundation you've built. Or you can also then uh, turn up the strength relative to the power foundation you've, you've started to touch on. So again, it's, it's about manipulating variables rather than going from pretty old school training practices of going strength block, building block, uh, power block. I think that's a bit of an outdated concept. And if you can run all of those physical qualities together and, and wave load them block to block to block, I think you'll see the best outcome. Tom, what do you think? What, what's your take? Well, I mean, I think, this is a, I think this is actually quite a nice program to look at because you see it's very specific to live. Um, you know, there's a lot of jumping involved in this that I think you probably wouldn't necessarily need with with several other athletes but each athlete is individually going to have their own challenges so maybe someone has a shoulder problem so they're going to need uh, you know those first two instead of doing the the jumps maybe they need some shoulder stuff that they need to do uh, you know someone else is going to have um, maybe a back issue so if it was me you definitely would be starting off with uh, a lot more stuff focused on the spine as an example um, but the key thing is here is that you you know throughout the program you have got some of those compound lift in there which give you you know good bang for your buck in terms of the fact that you're hitting multiple muscles together and for every athlete uh, doing jujitsu uh, especially if you're doing ACC rules you know you need to make sure your your hamstrings are, are strong and you need to make sure that your uh, your your legs are strong as well right so uh, the strength uh, focus on the on the lower body I think would also be something that would probably stay relatively consistent across uh, across athletes but the point the point is that you know every training program should be developed relative to the athlete that you're working with and also to the sport and also to the rules of the sport or the position of the sport depending on you know what you're doing so if you're a goalkeeper in soccer it's different than if you're a striker as an example and I think it's important that people understand that and realize this is why it's not always a good idea just to go on the internet pick up a training program and copy it I'm not saying that that, that can't work especially for a beginner there was excellent beginner training programs that you pointed out earlier in the podcast that can be useful. But when it comes down to developing something for a high performance athlete, they're training multiple times a, a day, you know, several days a week. I think it's really important that you get some professional help there and someone that can really help you. And over time, you adjust that training program to fit in with yourself. Um, and as Liv described, also making sure that you are adjusting things from month to month or from cycle to cycle. And you're getting feedback from yourself as the athlete. You're giving feedback to your coach to making sure that, um, that they understand what you're feeling and therefore that you can develop the best tra possible training program together. So I think they're the kind of take home messages that um, I would give to people, uh, especially competitive jiu-jitsu athletes. But I think now we've seen an example of, of, um, of one training program done one way. But of course, if you went and spoke to people competing at ADCC or medalists or whatever else, everyone would have a different um, SNC program. And really what, uh, you know, you can be successful in jiu-jitsu regardless of what SNC program you have, but 
if you have an SSE program backed by science and an SSE program that, that's specific to you, then it's more likely to give you the outcomes that you want. I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. Yeah, absolutely. And my contact information will be in the you know the description below. And if anyone's interested in in you know asking questions, I'm certainly open and available to them. I think Tommy, you you really hammered the point home there. As as if you're a competitor and at a high level, certainly you're going to require much more individual and tailored information to you and your performance as is relevant to you right now. If you're a beginner, you know you can pick up anything. Most things will work. Um, but if you're a really high competitor and you've got lots of demands in your technical tactical training and you're training a program overall, you're going to need a high level SNC coach and a high level program to ensure that you're getting better. So no, I couldn't agree more with what you said. Yeah. And I think uh, important to also say that we, even though, you know, like the, the programs changed week to week, we did actually vary it quite a bit. Uh, I would often wake up with like a hip just being really sore and I couldn't get out of bed. And I was like, I can't do a deadlift today. And we would do something different. You know, I would wake up with a sore shoulder or elbow or whatever body part it was on any given day. And I wouldn't not train, but I would train with whatever I could, you know, like, so <laughs> there were plenty of things, pl plenty of obstacles along the way, but we, you sort of can't, you, you have, there's a, a difference between training through injuries and doing anything to like injure yourself more uh, and actually being smart about it and still trying to, to complete your goal without injuring or causing yourself permanent damage. So, actually, uh, I, I love this story because I, I tell it to a lot of people, but other athletes, but I think I had, one joint left to program for yeah. uh, is that we had uh, saw AC joints in both shoulders, inflamed elbows from, you know, general arm bars and, and jiu-jitsu training, a hip labrum tear and general adductor pain, no ACL, a torn MCL, a meniscus and bone fracture, and a torn calf in one of your knees, uh, ongoing arthritis in both feet and an almost detached retina at some stage in the program. So uh, when it makes me laugh when SNC coaches argue about like, Oh, front, front squat versus back squat or, you know, deadlift versus RDL or whatever. It's like, you know what? At some stage, it's just what <laughs> works and <laughs> what actually can get the job done relative to uh, what the athlete is presenting with. So certainly there's an element that you need to be agile and flexible in your program. Yeah, and we, and we spend a lot of time communicating that. We also like even Ben, uh, you had me fill up an app every day to monitor my my load and and how fatigued I was and so on to to try to um, see how much I'm going to lift and how tr how heavy my jiu jitsu sessions actually were. So we were trying to monitor everything as much as possible and actually communicate and 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 always talk about it as well. That's a really good point. There, I mean, you know, you have this plan that you you're using and hopefully the plan is logical. But then when it comes to the actual day, you know, you have to make sure that you make adjustments on the fly and you have a plan B and you know what you're going to work on and what, what's important in your program. And that's why it's important to prioritize stuff and to and to be clear up front about what's important. Because, you know, if this if you've got an athlete and they, you give them a plan, some athletes are very like they must follow everything in the plan. So sometimes when I write training programs for athletes like that, I actually write them with rep ranges. I write them with like a ranges of exercises, loads of stuff. So if, the, if I've written, let's say, 10 exercises for the athlete to do and they've only only can complete six they don't feel like distraught because they weren't able to do the last four because for them missing uh, sets or missing exercises would be considered failure so it's always good to have that plan b and uh, and, and make sure that you know you are adjusting things and uh, you know we probably can talk about monitoring and stuff some, at some other point in the future but yeah monitoring your training program making sure you're fully recovered and making sure that uh, you're on track is of course key and that's where sports science really comes in and that's where we didn't talk too much about it today where the, the monitoring of the program and then the adjustment that's the essentially the the art and the science of um, achieving high performance really yeah absolutely and and i will say this was a unique uh rehabilitation and also a unique performance program as it live was as i said before both the athlete and the physio uh because it, it reduced the amount of uh, communication circles there were and it was a, you know, a, a very enjoyable and in the end a successful program given that she did qualify for ADCC and it was a, uh, yeah, it was an interesting ride, but a very long ride. And, you know, in the end, it was a very enjoyable ride. So I'm certainly very thank thankful for Liv for trusting me with the program, but also, uh, you know, the outcome we pr produced and, and with, you know, the input of the, the very, very significant and uh, large input from Lockie and Liv as, 
as jiu-jitsu coaches themselves. Uh, you know, we, we got the end goal in the end. So without them, it certainly uh, I played a very small part in, in, in the role itself, but it was a, yeah, a, a fun ride nonetheless. It was fun. It was torturous and fun. It was, uh, <laughs> now, it's nice when you have a goal and, you know, and a plan that it actually pays off. And it, it doesn't happen every time, you know, out of out of 10, it might happen two or three times where you're like, I'm going to win this comp and these are my goals and I'm uh, my aims and I'm going to do this, this and this in order to get here. And it doesn't always happen. And you gain other things in the process. And I always do knowledge and, and experience and so on. But when you can actually like achieve the main goal, it's a really cool feeling. Absolutely, you know, totally, and, and I think this is something that you know I noticed with uh, well, me and Lockie discussed at some point, maybe off air, but I was saying, you know, when you create a good plan, you create a good program. What you're doing is you're increasing the probability that you'll win. It doesn't mean you're mm -hmm. going to be certain. Yeah. So I remember when I woke up, and I, I remember when I saw, you know, because the ADCC was in in America, and I woke up and saw the results for Lockie's first day. I was like, I know who, how much effort and you know, stuff he put into that and it didn't go so well. And then I woke up on the second day and I was like, oh my God, what happened? And, it, you know, the reality was that that could have happened on the first day as well, right? It's just that the probabilities in the second day went in his favor, where in the first day, they didn't go in his favor, you know? And uh, and that's the reality, you know, what you're doing with training and what you're doing with strength and conditioning is you're trying to tip the odds in your favor. And you tip them in your favor, but there's still some luck involved. And that's why, especially something like the UFC, it's like champions don't stay champions forever because Every time you step on the mat in a combat sport, anyone can win, anyone can lose. It's a small margin between winning and losing. And, uh, you know, you're just trying to tip those uh, scales in your favor. So, everybody, thank you ever so much for, um, you know, getting there and live. And thanks for sharing your program and your experiences. And, Ben, thanks for, uh, you know, taking the time out to, to talk with me today about, you know, all of this stuff. And I guess what we'll do is... Uh, if anybody has any other questions, then we can, uh, of course, answer them and maybe do like a, a wrap up with some questions that came out of the uh, discussions, you know, on Reddit, in the comments uh, and from people sending us uh, personal messages as well. We can do that as well. But uh, yeah, thank you ever so much. And um, it's been a fun couple of, uh, couple of sessions doing this program. Um. But yeah, it, it, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>